We shall be reading from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4 and verse 14. Chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this he is required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honour to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Amen. The people of God need a high priest, and they need priests also. People who hear the word of God, who accept the word of God, who believe in the word of God, who believe in a God, in other words, as he is described in his word, holy, perfect, without sin, a God who loves all men, but at the same time, his righteousness, God's righteousness, because He is perfectly righteous, His righteousness makes Him a judge before men, as God is holy, and people are full of sin. So on one side there is a perfect God in holiness and pureness and in love, and on the other side there is a perfect, yes man, as a man, but with his relationship with God, he is imperfect, incomplete. I am very tall. If I compare myself with my grandchild, Anna, I'm 172, and my grandchild is 50 centimeters high. I'm very tall, but I'm very, very short in front of a basketball player who's 215. It depends where you compare yourself to. Man, as a man, is perfect. This glass is made out of glass, but it's perfect as a glass. Because it has been made for a reason, for a purpose in which it does fulfill. But if you compare it with something out of porcelain, you throw it out. But if you compare it with a precious stone, this glass is useless. So, Man as a man is a perfect creation, and God has made him to be according to his image and his likeness. But his relationship with God, he is totally useless, perfectly incomplete. He cannot go near God. It is the darkness with the light. It is sin with holiness. That's why between God 
and the people which God chose and loves and takes care of. It is necessary to be a high priest and priests. Maybe it's better for me to say priest and some of them to be high priest, which they will intercede to God for mankind. For the sins of mankind. Not only will he intercede, but in the law God gave something even more. To sacrifice also blood of lambs, goats, calves for the sins of the people. For the sins of the body of the people. And so, because it cannot be done in any other way. Whatever God does, my brethren, it isn't just for the sake of doing something. Let's do this and do that. Whatever God does, it is totally necessary. Whatever God tells us, it is good if you do this. It is totally necessary for you to do it. And it is totally necessary because God gives us the least to do. He says, the burden, my burden that I'm giving you, is very light. I'm not putting you more on your shoulders you can take. Whatever God predestines for man is the least necessary for his life. For his blessings, for his joy, for his success. The priests, in the people of Israel, the Old Testament, and especially the high priest, had a very important role. He went through the veil and entered from the holy part of the sanctuary into the holiest of all, in which only the high priest entered. So you can offer there sacrifice of calves, goats, specifically it says bulls and goats for the sins of the people and if he himself was a sinner and the presence of God came in the holiest of all as a cloud he would die on the spot and that's why they tied him with a rope which had bells on it so they could hear through the veil they could hear the bells and they would say he's alive but if for a long period of time they could not hear the bells they said that he's dead in the presence of God. He could not stand as a sinner in the presence of God. And they would pull the rope in which he was tied up with so they can pull him out. Who could ever enter into the presence of God? The presence of God was awesome in the Old Testament in the holiest of all. And the high priest could not enter as he wanted to. He entered with a special garment. Firstly, he washed himself. He washed himself very well and then he wore the suit which the high priest wore which was made out of linen, white linen. Short trousers of fine woven linen and a sash of fine woven linen. And he was dressed in white and he even wore a plate of the holy crown of pure gold. And he wore this once a year, entered in the holiest of all, and offered the sins for all the people. He offered sacrifice and for his own sins firstly, and then the people of Israel. And then he found the goat. He chose two goats. One was a scapegoat, and all the sins fell on that goat. It was a ritual in which reality, my brethren, it was what was to come. The high priest, the great high priest, Jesus Christ. A ritual which was necessary for the cleansing of the sins of the bodies of the people. And I point this out because God says it. It was a ritual. It was a sacrifice. A priest who was anointed with the holy anointment of being a high priest for that year he, he was dressed all in white or linen clean 
with the bells on and tied with the rope and he entered with fear and trembling so he can pray and sacrifice for the sins of himself firstly and then of the peoples and if and the people of Israel found grace the sins were forgiven he took the blood he sprinkled on the people of Israel and took the scapegoat put all the sins on him and that goat left and the people were free from sin and they continued their life in the presence of God in the temple of God and always according with the word of God that day in which the high priest entered into the holiest of all was a day of redemption that's what it was called redemption for the sins of all the people and now things in the New Testament have changed and they have changed totally they have changed and they have changed totally now God hasn't got a man high priest and the Bible says the man high priest was not appointed on his own he did not say he will become a high priest I will okay we'll make you he did not take this honor this glory for him to be a high priest for the people on his own but that honor that glory God gave with his calling God it was he who called Aaron and made him a high priest and from the family of Aaron the high priest came from as from the tribe of Levi Levites and priests came from one of the children of Levi was Aaron from the family of Aaron the high priest came from and the priests so the Bible says and no man takes this honor to himself but he who is called by God just as Aaron was so this honor not taken on himself so he can appoint himself a high priest but who God called as he did firstly with Aaron but now in the New Testament priesthood was counseled from the tribe of Levi from the family of Aaron because now this priesthood is not able to sacrifice and offer not only for the sins of the flesh but especially the sins of the conscience the conscience of man is cleansed and this is being born again my brethren the conscience of man the heart of man is freed is changed the sins are forgiven only with the blood not in which man priest will sacrifice but with the blood in which God gave on the cross of Calvary Jesus Christ's blood and so the high priest now which who sacrifices for us who was sacrificed in reality for us is a new great high priest and I read from verse 14 seeing then we the Church of Christ the people of God we do not have a man high priest who sacrifices for the sins of our flesh but we have a great high priest who has it doesn't pass through the view so he can enter in the holiest of war and to sacrifice for the people but he passed through the heavens the view was torn in half and he passed through the heavens and it is he who God established appointed high priest great high priest saying firstly you are my son today I have begotten you in other words with his resurrection he passed through the heavens not through the veil but through the heavens so he can intercede pray for the sins of ours body spirit and soul this is the promise of God you are my son today I have begotten you and the second thing is that I have made you a, a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek not now according to the order of Aaron God creates a new priesthood in the New Testament great high priest now is Jesus Christ who did not pass through the veil but passed through the heavens and what does he stand now before the throne of God on the right hand side of God and what does he do he prays and 
intercedes. But as he became the great high priest and prays for all people, at the same time he established us and him, my beloved brethren. We must be very careful today and not believe that God wants to give us this to understand because I, he gave it to me to understand also. Since Christ was appointed a great high priest, we now are appointed. We who confessed him. We confess the good confession that Jesus Christ is the Lord, our Lord and God. He is our Savior, our Redeemer. He is the Son of the Living God. He is the High Priest according to the order of Melchizedek. With that confession, therefore, we are established, appointed as priests. And the Bible says this to us. You are priests and kings of the Most High. And why are we priests? and kings of the Most High, because Melchizedek, in the order in which Christ became a priest, he was a king of Salem, king of peace, and the priest of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. He had two characteristics, king and priest. That is the order which is different from the order of men, which had one characteristic, only priesthood. So in the order of Melchizedek, Christ, a great high priest, has two characteristics, a king and a priest. Because therefore we confessed him. If you believe with your, your heart and confess with your lips, then you are a son of God, the word of God assures us. Because you, we have confessed him. We have confessed He is the Son of the Living God, that He saved us, that He does save us always. He prays for us. He is the brightness of the glory of God. Automatically, we were born again in a living hope for us to be one day to enter as Jesus Christ through the heavens and sit as priests and kings of the Most High. But now we have become also through faith. But what does this mean now? Since the Word of God assures us that we are firstly priests, it means that we have duties, we have obligations as priests of the Most High. And now, duties and obligations are the duties and the obligations of a priest, not the priest of men, but the priests in which their names are written in the Book of Life. And the priest sacrifices, he prays, he intercedes, he takes care of the house of the Lord. He takes care of God's things. He takes care for the right adoration. It is he who stands responsible before God in the temple of God. And we have, all of us, not just the elders, deacons and the pastors, they have other services and obligation which God gives in the church. But we all, as we are firstly priests of the Most High, we have duties, obligations. And what does the Word of God say? I want all to pray. And it says, firstly, the men lifting up clean hands for all people. Something in which we rarely do, maybe because we haven't understood it. And we are lacking in the demands in which the Word of God puts before us and in our obligations in which we must say that we are the priests of the Most High, kings and priests. Let me remind you that Jesus Christ taught us two things. You are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. The light of the world and the salt of the earth. The light of the world, you cannot be if you are not in actions, not in theory or in words. A king, and we'll see what this is, and priest of the Most High. A king and the priest of the Most High does, fulfills all his obligations, his duties. A king has a responsibility for the safety and for war. It is he who keeps safe protects, defends all the people then, the people of Israel. And the priest, it is he who prays and intercedes for all, 
for all the people. And these are our obligations also. Our obligations are not only to come to church, to enjoy, to glorify God, to bring our petitions before God, to demand many times from God, to answer to our petitions. What a brother once had said, it's not good to think that Christ is our plumber and when it's damage done in our house we call him to fix it. This is not the life of a Christian. The life of a Christian is firstly light of this world and secondly salt, salt of the earth. And these are these nice characteristics, priest and king of the Most High. The salt preserves, the light shines and guides. The light reigns in darkness. A Christian reigns in this world. The salt preserves things, makes things tasty. The Church of Christ prays so the world can be preserved. So God can keep the world safe to remove His judgment from the world of sin. He prays for His enemies. He prays for the people who mock Him, treat Him unjustly. Now I don't know how much we do this as people, as a family and as a church. How in other words do we really stand where God wants us to stand? We work as God wants us to work. May God give us wisdom and understanding, my brethren, and lots of grace we must find from God so we can walk as He wants us to walk. These are very serious things. If really we want to say that we are true Christians and Christians are the first apostolic church, very serious things indeed. You see, when, and this stunned me, when, the church was persecuted because the church will be persecuted in the world and it cannot be otherwise because the prince of this world is a devil in which the church cannot find grace before his eyes. He hates the church. He is a murderer. We ruin his job. We must understand this, my brethren, that as a church, as Christians, we are problems for the world. We create problems for them. And the problems are not human and earthly, that we go against the law, but the problem is that we bring their evil works of darkness into the light. We reveal the plans of the devil. We reveal the plans of Christ. How these revelations done in the world, the church does this, we reveal that they worship idols, that they fornicate. People don't know what fornication is and we say that fornicators will not go to heaven, they go to hell. Adulterers will not go to heaven, they go to hell. We must not think that we will go where everyone else will go. And we say these things in boldness and I was stunned when there was persecution to the first apostolic church and they threatened them, then took again, or you will be lost. They prayed and said, they did not say, Lord, keep us safe, protect us, so we won't be lost. But they said to God, give us courage and boldness, so we'll never stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, what they asked for was for God to cover their weaknesses. But you shall be lost. We will not be lost, my brethren. Is it ever possible for the body of Christ to be lost, wasted? Is it possible for anyone to harm the children of God who, who God keeps as the apple of His eye? What are we in danger of? Deceit, fear, weakness, mistakes, of having a good time, of enjoyment. That's what a Christian is in danger of. Be careful. Today, I understood everything with the grace of Christ. Be careful, it says, from bad living. Be careful of drunkenness. 
Who's he saying these things to? To Christians. Be careful from the worries of everyday life. Be careful of these things. This is our danger. Our danger is not the neighbor. Christ will take care of the neighbor. My heart is in danger. If it is and remains upright before God as to do all the will of God, and how will I always do the will of God if I don't know the will of God? And how will I learn the will of God if no, no one teaches me? And this is the doctrine of the Apostle, my brethren. Because here, the place in which we come, what is it? It is a school. We have a teacher. Unbelievable. Imaginable. The Spirit of Truth. Jesus Christ the Lord. He says to us, My child, were you ever the priest of the Most High? Were you? Did you pray for the sins of the people? For the remission of the sins of the people? Were you ever the King of the Most High? Did you work for the salvation of men? For the salvation. And what is your work? Very easily, my brethren, we could say, that I hand out Christian newspapers. That is not the work. It, it's, that's work also. But a king was 24 hours a day a king. And a priest was 24 hours a day a priest. But my beloved brethren, instead of us going to our responsibilities and our obligation as kings and priests of the Most High, the blessed word of God comes and tells us, leave these things now. Come, and let me tell you where you have to start from. Come, let me tell you, man, unimportant, small, but I love you so much where you should start from. You have understand very well that your high priest isn't a man, Aaron, but it's man, Jesus Christ. That's why. Because you know very well that you have such a great high priest who pass not through the veil of the temple, but pass through the heavens. In other words, Jesus, the Son of God. Firstly, let us hold fast our confession. Firstly, be careful to hold fast. Not to say that I am Christ, I am Christ, but for it to show that you are Christ. That's, that is what it means to hold fast your confession. For to be obvious that you are a Christian, how you drive, how do you drive? For it to be obvious that you are Christ when you walk on the street, the way you dress, when you talk, when you work, when you're dealing with things, when other people see you, you are a priest and king of the Most High, and your behavior must be as a king and as a priest. For you to hold fast the confession Two, the best way of evangelizing my brethren is the testimony of your life. Only the testimony of your life is that which reveals to people Christ, if you are the light. I've seen people who talk about Christ to God, and damage is done. Not good. And they have no results at all. You might say, is it bad? I'm not saying it's bad. Maybe they're doing good. But firstly, they must do something else. They must firstly, first of all, to be in their lives, holding, holding fast their confession. Their confession must be firstly be evident in their surroundings. Well, that's called your husband, wife, children. Don't go and confess outside of your house if you've messed up inside your house. What kind of confession will you make? And will I make? If your word, your family doesn't accept, will others accept it? Will others accept it? Let's hold fast our confession, my brethren. You might say to me, will everyone accept? No, not everyone will accept our word, but all will acknowledge that truly we are Christ's. And they will say, I cannot be like you. That's a different thing. It's a different story. As they have said, and I thank God that I've heard it a few times. I should have heard it more. But unfortunately, I've only heard it a few times. But it's very important to hear this. I cannot be like you. 
leave from work and get straight to church. Let me alone. I can't do this. How will I live when I go to a bar? When I drink whiskey? When I go and have a good time? When I go and see a soccer game? When I go to cinema? To the theatre? Well, I only just go to church. Okay, you're a good man. But I cannot be like you. That's a different story. In that way, it is evident that you are holding fast the confession of faith, the confession of Jesus Christ. But when you are like the others, when without hesitation they say before you what they say among themselves, when what they say which cannot be heard because they're shocking, you laugh at them and you laugh with them. And I won't say that you say things in which you shouldn't say. They laugh as well. We do not hold then our confession. And you know, my brethren, if we don't hold fast our confession, how will the high priest, the great high priest, who passed through the heavens, will hold for us? I will say the expression, which is not right, his obligations. Of course, God is faithful. He cannot deny himself. He cannot. But if we are unfaithful, he cannot do anything else. Today, therefore, I believe that with a beautiful and sweet way, God is admonishing us very much so, all of us, first of all me and all of us. Do you hold fast the confession? If Christ is revealed in your life, in every way you act, then Christ is glorified in your life. But if you do not hold fast your confession, then Christ is mocked. It's better for you not to talk at all. You cannot say, I am Christ, or whatever else, and for you to be like the world. It's better for you not to talk at all. It is better for you not to talk at all. For, and God comes and helps us now in our thoughts, because these thoughts bring us into sadness, disappointment, but sometimes even in reacting badly. What can I do? I'm a man. I fell. And we justify our actions and ourselves. Is it bad? What can I do? And God comes and says, Now, let me tell you something. God is not unjust to put a high priest who cannot understand you because he is perfect. He cannot say, in other words, to this cup. You are useless because you are made of glass. He could say it, but God didn't do such nonsense to compare things that are not alike. God, His face with man, does not compare the two. And He said, look how holy I am, and you're just an empty tin can. We, we people do these things. And the Bible says, if we compare ourselves with other people in reality, we are fools. God does not come and say, how, what a fool you are, how silly you are, and you cannot do what I say, but do them unless I will throw you in hell. What do you mean you throw me in hell? You made me like this. It's not my fault. If you throw me in hell, you made me like that. Throw me into hell. But God doesn't say this. He says, you must know that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. With our weaknesses. He sympathizes with us because he understands them but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. The high priest in which God called for you is that he went through all that a man is possible to go through, and even more so in the worst way. He was tempted by the devil as no other man was. He was mocked as no other, other man was mocked before. And in the end, he died, as no other man has ever died, and ever will. For f the Father, to turn his face away in the day time of his death, he died, full of the sins of the world. 
He became a curse. It's not therefore a high priest. He's not a high priest who not only is without sin, in which he needs to pray for his own sins also, but even much more so, he's not a high priest who does not know what it means to suffer trial, sorrow, sickness, pain, agonies, anxieties of death. He knows everything, my brethren. What Ever your my trial might be, Christ has gone through it. Whatever my trial might be, no matter how great it might seem, whatever I might think of, Christ has gone through it in a much greater, greater scale. Christ has. And try and find loneliness. He was never with company, he was all alone. Without a spouse, he was never married. He was mocked, they never stopped mocking him, with threats. He was beaten, punched, on the cross of Calvary. My brethren, there is no trial that man has gone through and Christ hasn't gone through first, the Son of the living God, a hundred times more. There's no such a trial. And he accepted the Son of God to go through these trials so he can be able to understand your pain. And let me say something, my brethren, how serious it is. My sorrow, no one can understand. My pain, no one can understand. Even if it is my little now hurting, or if it is the greatest pain, the only one who can understand it is he who lives it, or who has lived it. The toothache, my toothache, you can all understand it because everyone has had a toothache, but the pain on my shoulder, which I don't have, you cannot understand it. Only if someone has lived it before. Your pain, your sorrow, the only one who understands it. All your sorrow, sorrows, all your pains, all your anxieties, all your problems, the only one who understands them all is Christ. He, the love of God, made a high priest. So when He goes and prays for you, to sympathize because he remembers his own trial when he was a man. That's why it says, it's not a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but he's a high priest who was trialed in all points as we were, yet with a great difference. He suffered, was trialed, was tempted, but he did not sin. But we, rarely, we are without sin. And I won't say never. All our trials lead us to sin. Having therefore such a high priest who can understand us totally, who can understand us always and in all, having therefore such a high priest, the Bible says, let us therefore come boldly, without being ashamed, without hesitation, with courage, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Let's see my brethren now, what beautiful words, there is a throne, a throne of grace. There is a throne in which when you go near it and humble yourself, you will find grace from God for all your sufferings, your troubles, your sorrows, your trials, your sicknesses, your diseases, your sins, your transgressions, for all that provoke problems in your life. 
Now God comes. Since you have such a high priest who understands you, do not be frightened to come to the throne of His grace. Let's go boldly to the throne of grace. Why? So we may obtain mercy so He can show mercy. You shall find mercy. You shall receive mercy. You will. Only go near it in boldness. Why? Because before that throne of grace, there on the right hand side stands the high priest. And on the throne of God, the high priest says, Father, Father, He is mine. Oh, if you only knew. Because the Father cannot sympathize with us. Oh, if only you knew, Father, what it means to be alone. I was alone, Father, and I know what it means to be lonely. And God knows very well the heart of His Son. And through Christ, He sympathizes with us. The Father sympathizes with us. Because we, when He saw His Son being mocked, the Father was hurting. When He saw Him being insulted, tempted, the Father was full of anxiety. And now, George Corovesi goes before the throne of God. And when he goes near, Christ says, Did they mock him? Remember, Father, how they mocked me. He's going through the same things as I did. I was. Are they insulting him? Are they accusing him? Is he sick? Is he hurting? Is he alone? Has he got sorrows? And the high priest brings to the Father all your problems, all your anxieties. And the Father, for His Son's sake, for the sake of Jesus Christ, who He loves and knows that all these things He went through without sin, forgives your sin. Hallelujah. For the sake of Christ, who was without sin, He was troubled, He suffered in all those trials and temptations. The Father now shows mercy and to us. And He says to me, when I go, full of sin, dirty, vile, in shame, Christ says to me, come, come, don't be embarrassed. And when I go near the throne, the Father says, I'm giving you grace for my Son's sake. Hallelujah. He says something more, which is important in the Word of God. For us to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, let's see how serious it is. You will not come in boldness before me in the time of your need. Because it's possible for you not to be able then. Now you shall come to pray to me to find grace and mercy. So, they can be kept aside. Mercy and grace of God when you shall need it. See what we people say. We say, how much money do we make? We hold a bit aside for a rainy day. And God sees this as wisdom. What does a prodigal do? He eats and drinks without caring. What does a wise man do? He eats and drinks, but in a little way, so he can have some left aside in the period of his need. That's what Christ is telling us tonight the Word of God, which is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It says to us, therefore, why, my child, don't you put mercy and grace aside, in which you shall need? Come and put aside. I mean, my brethren, let's put a bit aside, my brethren, grace and mercy. That's why, let's not hesitate to go near. And tomorrow, we'll all go near the throne of grace of God and say, Lord, dear God, please help us to find mercy and grace for our way from now on. We don't know what we'll have to encounter. We don't know what we shall meet. But we know one thing, that our Lord invites us with boldness to stand before the throne of grace of God. 
so we can obtain mercy and find grace through Jesus Christ. Amen.